music. You can't connect this to this device.
Good evening. It's a musical intro that Stephen put together to get you in the mood to talk about the Revolutionary War and most specifically Thomas Carney. My name is Cleve Corner. I'm the manager of author and speaker engagement here at the Pratt. I'm so happy you could be here. A couple of housekeeping notes before we start. Stephen's going to talk for between 35 and 40 minutes and then have time for your questions, about 20 minutes of your questions. Afterwards, he's going to sign books right there. And uh, just so you know that his book is for sale out front. So after the program, please purchase a book so Stephen can sign it for you. Tonight, I'm happy to welcome Stephen Lee to the Pratt Library to discuss his book, The Story of Mr. Thomas Carney, the first book on a Maryland African-American military man of the Revolutionary War. A free black enlistee from the Eastern Shore, Thomas Carney was a heroic soldier who served in both the Maryland Line and the Continental Army. Joining us here, the author shares his journey of historical research that led to the creation of the book, multicultural and portrayal of early Maryland heritage, innovative in its image of early Maryland black, free black community, and premiere in its representation of a Maryland African-American hero in the war for the birth of our nation. The story of Mr. Thomas Carney is a ceiling breaking publication in Maryland and American history. Stephen Lee is a commissioner for the Maryland Commission on African-American History and Culture, project director of the Heritage Museum, an adjunct professor of history at Stevenson University, and was the founding director of the Benjamin Banneker Historical Park and Museum. He has written broadly on the omitted history of early Maryland's free Ameri African-Americans at the Our History, Our Heritage website of the Maryland Historical Trust. It is my great pleasure to welcome Stephen Lee to the Pratt Library. I started out with the music of Joseph Malone, Chevalier de Angel. Are many of you familiar with him? Great. If you attended any of the Heritage Museum concerts, oh, I don't know, way back in the 90s, the classical or traditional music program, I featured his music there. You got to see it played live. Uh, if you attended the grand opening of the Benjamin Banneker Historical Park and Museum, I also had uh, Chamber group play his music then again live. Uh, so I've been featuring his work for a few decades. And it's really great to see him finally getting the recognition he deserves. He's in television programs now. There's even a film about Sam Jewel Chapman. So uh, that's really good to see. He was a popular French musician, a uh, man of color. African American, uh, after he came out of the Caribbean, the French Caribbean. Uh, his, he was a leading composer and performer of the music of his time. And he was also a contemporary 
16th century that there was all this horrible enslavement, mass enslavement of black people across the continent. There were individuals and some communities, enclaves of free blacks who were living what we would say comparatively normal lives. And nowhere is that more true and more important than right here in memory. We were the colony, arguably, with the largest population of free blacks. But how many of us were taught that in school? I certainly was. I was taught everybody was a slave, except for Benjamin Banner. We were all slaves. And it, it was so ingrained in my head that when my father told me that his father's people were never slaves, I didn't believe him. I said, oh no, Dad, everybody was a slave. And that is inexplicably what we are taught. And uh, I've been trying for a long time for us for Maryland to get over that, but it's, it's a struggle. Uh, concurrent with the large numbers of the enslaved, bought, bred, and sold right here in Maryland, there were considerable numbers of free blacks and families developing communities and contributing to the growth of everyday life. And they, too, are part of the Maryland story. Notice I didn't say a part of black history. This is Maryland's story. And up until we, you know, until that's taught all Marylanders, we're not really being honest. This clicker. Okay. That's what I was saying earlier, all through school. We weren't taught about the free black community. We weren't taught of any of the black men, the fuck the sons, the brothers, the husbands that went to war in 1775 through 1783 to fight for the birth of this country. Now that's deep. Why is it in Maryland that we don't teach? that black men also fought in that war. Why are we led to believe it was only white men in Maryland who answered the call? Something is, is just not right about that. It was around 1990, that I had a chance to see a copy of the passenger manifesto to the heart of the job. And I, I was literally in shock when I saw that there were three passengers listed as men of color. Mine, I, I remembered that, I never forgot the name. Just seeing it, it made me remember the name. Minus John Price and the Dice. Two of them were thought to be Afro-Portuguese. I haven't found out about the third one specifically. And I believe there could be even more passengers of African descent. I, I, I'm sure there was a woman in there somewhere. But uh, I'm still researching because I only saw one page of a manifest. And, and there were several pages. And the Ark and the Dove, they picked up passengers, let passengers off on their way to America. I know at one point, I think it stopped in the Caribbean. I'm sure some black folks got on there then. So uh, that's ongoing work. But what really struck me was that from the very beginning, there were black people in Maryland who were free. The first Black Maryland were not slaves. The first black Marylanders were not slaves. Think about that. So that's when Maryland African Americans began. It did not begin with slavery. The first slave ships didn't get here until 1642. That was eight years later. 
So it stands to reason that during those eight years, there were other ships from Europe coming here. There were other free black people on those ships. These free black people were getting married, having babies, and you know, a lot of stuff that happened in these years. So that's where our history begins. And again, why is that not included? So that started me on a journey, a journey of research. And my research was into three African Americans, not just Revolutionary War, though it ended up leading into that, and inevitably to this book, which brings us all here today. But these were some of the primary bullets that got me really going, and in the direction that what we hear is where I stand now. Ark in the Dove passenger list, Reverend George Bragg's book. Not many people are familiar with that publication. It dates back to, what, 1914? But George Bragg talked about the three black history of Maryland that is often left out. And that made me very good. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention a historian that's no longer with us, Ms. Jacqueline Verdeer, because she was the one who turned me on to the book. And turned me on to the book. Yeah, Ms. Lanier about Bragg's, because I was not familiar with it. And it's a very hard book to find. And if you knew Jacqueline Lanier, she had one of the most awesome collection of African American material. And she had the original first edition copy of the George Bragg book, which I've never seen since. <laughs> then there was Dr. Benjamin Walsh, a brilliant historian here in Maryland. And, and I often think about Dr. Walsh because this man's knowledge about history was so great. It must have been extremely frustrating to him to be operating in this climate where he knew what our story was and, and couldn't change what was the public, considered the public history of education. But I can't speak high enough to that as a historian. And uh, the two works of his that were most influential influential on me was The Negro and the Making of America, and The Negro and the American Revolution. Then there was the William Paul Dehead. I came across that, that was in the mid-90s. And that really got me interested in Thomas Carney. William Con uh, Paul Dehead came across Thomas his obituary and made an article. And he took some, some liberty in his interpretation, but that's okay. He did a great job in bringing Thomas Carney forward from his 200 year banishment. The call to head article led me to finding the real obituary, which I did. It took a bit of hunting, but I did find the obituary. It was written in the Nile's Weekly Register in August. Thank you for working. That's a copy of it. Now, this is interesting. This Nile's Register came out, and the Nile's Weekly was one of the biggest newspapers. That edition came out in August 23, 1828. It's time of the obituary. He died in 1828. But what Niles did was to reprint an article from the Eastern Star, which was one of the bigger newspapers on the Eastern Shore, from July 18th. But Carney actually passed on June 30th. 
So I just found that in this book from June 30th to August 23. That's almost two months for it to reach the big newspaper. What a contrast from today, where when something happens, you know, 10 minutes later, it's on worldwide web. So things took a little bit longer. This is a blow-up from the very top of that article, uh, talking about Carnegie as a past at the age of 74. And notice it mentions him serving under Peter Adams. Uh, it says here, soon after this, Washington retired, and, and they're speaking of the battles in Pennsylvania, I believe, with the British book. Um, retired to Valley Forge. It does not specify that Thomas Carney went with Washington to Valley Forge. And I'm, I'm saying that because some people say Thomas Carney reported Valley Forge. I have not been able to find any record of that. Believe me, I've been looking. So uh, you have to read some primary source material kind of there. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the daughters of the American Revolution were forgotten patriots, African American and Native American patriots of the Revolutionary War. I think that was an exceptional work. They don't include everyone. I think their list is about 350 people. And we know that there were estimates go from 2,000 8,000 black men from Maryland that fought in the war. But what's important is that they were the first group to try to compile and research who these people were. And I give them credit for that. As I think I said earlier, my research period starts with 1634. Well, actually, I, I researched black history. Ever, and all across the world, but my primary focus since discovering the Ark and the Gulf Passage has been from 1634 to 1861 here in Maryland. That's where I have for the past few decades devoted to my study. In the course, I've found many interesting community black books. The Hill in East. And I know those of you who are of the Maryland Commission of African Americans in Culture are very familiar with all this stuff. Uh, the Hill and East, Jonathan Side and Pagan's Town, Scott's Point in Chester Town. And we all know the Bannikers, but I came to find out where Benjamin Banneker lived. There were many black folks who lived. He, he wasn't an anomaly on that street. There were many black families on that street in Oella, though you may not think that today. Why is none of this acknowledged in our education for our public? I keep asking that question because I, don't, I haven't found an answer, and I really want to know. As far back as the early 90s, I began initiatives to try to distribute this information about our early black history, our early Maryland history. I began to do a lot of exhibitions. Uh, one of the first and biggest ones was called Remember Maryland. And that exhibition won several awards and got to travel all across the and I still think it was a great exhibition, but I found out that when people go to the exhibits, they go, they're like, oh yeah, you know, this is cool, I didn't know that. And then a month later, it's all gone, and they're looking for a new exhibition. So it doesn't really have hold. And I found that to be the case with many of the exhibitions on African American history that I did. At the same time, I'm going to Board of Education, State Board, or the City Board, or the County, asking, 
why aren't you including this whole dimension of African, Maryland, African Americans? You can't just focus on one part. And what really got to me on that was England. The Romans enslaved the British. But all of British history is not interpreted from the focal point of them being slaves. Not at all. So why is this policy being applied to African Americans to the point that you don't even acknowledge that these people existed? Isn't that a question? So you can't give up. You have to keep going. The main excuse they would give me is, well, you know, we really don't have any resource for teaching African in our schools or, or to even do displays. Because I was going to our major museums and historical centers asking them this question. And for years, they were talking, well, we don't really have the resource, which was mind-boggling to me because, hey, this is the site, the state of Dr. Quarles. I mean, he did a tremendous amount of work. If you're willing to go and dig and find it, just go to Dr. Quarles. Or, as I mentioned earlier, Jacqueline Monier, who had this outrageous collection. And I know she went to several historical and cultural sites willing to share her collection in African American history. No, there's no resource material for teaching or developing display. And I was told that for decades. So to me what was really important as this young man here that this image of the early Maryland has to begin at that age. You know, I mean, that's what I want to reach. I don't want another generation growing up with this image of all of us as slaves in the back of their head when that's not happening. I want our young people to have an image of a whole free black early person of black heritage growing up in America in Maryland. And to me that is fundamental. Am I going to work? Yes. Uh, of all the stories I have researched, the one of Mr. Carney I found to be the most not only because of his military record, which was extraordinary, but there was a lot of documentation of his military service. There was documentation of his life. And so this is something you couldn't deny. This was something you couldn't say, well, there's no resource there, because it is there. And I just thought I had to compile it and put it there for people to see the next time. They want to give me that And so, how do you do that? Did you write a history textbook? Which I, was my first inclination to write a history textbook for Thomas Carter or for school, you know, just a record. To me, that's kind of boring. And when I was in school, you read the history textbook to get that A or B or A. And, uh, you know, when the semester's over, you wipe that out of your memory so you can get ready for the next semester. But what sticks or stuck in my head as a kid were stories, tales, legends. Of and what legends, what stories do we have of a free African American? Can you think of them? Of in Maryland, I couldn't, I couldn't think of any tale outside of Mr. Van Curve, but he 
the deaths and a more historical event. I wanted a real story of America. And I wanted to reach out young. So that's what brought me on this journey. So that's what I was speaking about. History, textbook versus a story. And how do you develop something that's going to appeal to both sides of your brain? History textbook is just going to appeal to that rational side of your thinking, the reason. But I also want to include your imagination, because that's where I think things stick the longest. And then there's that thing about cultural heritage being multicultural. Some people think to be multicultural, you just put different colored faces in the picture. And that's it. And they're all operating under this Western culture. But to be truly multicultural, you have to include elements of other cultures, not just paint a face a different color. And so I wanted the freedom to be able to do that. That's kind of hard to do in a history textbook, but you can certainly do it in a story. So that's what led me to think I needed to develop a documentary model. Documentary to take care of the history part of Mr. Carney. Dramatization to give me the freedom to bring in other elements where I want to make the story a little more interesting. And being me, I'm definitely going to introduce other cultural elements. So my, my goal was to make it interesting for kids, to spark their imagination of the early time of America, but I also wanted it to be interesting for adults. And to present a little challenge for adults. Even if uh, it's done geared towards kids. And I went back to Grimm's Fairy Tales. If you know Grimm's Fairy Tales, uh, you know, we all know it. all those classic stories. But as an adult, you can see them at a different level. And you understand that they're talking about some very serious issues. But as a kid, you don't get that out of the Yeah, that's what I was trying to talk about. So in this story, a little bit, most of the major elements, especially the characters, are all archetypes, symbols of something much greater than themselves. Thomas Carney. He symbolizes all of the African American soldiers. Those who were free and those who were enslaved. And there, there were quite a few enslaved black men who fought in the war. Because on these plantations, or even if you didn't have a big plantation, you had a small farm and you had some slaves working for you. That war got to be very serious, and they needed men. So you, every family, every property was supposed to you know, have men to serve. And so some of the white family who had slaves, rather than to put their sons forward, would make their slaves go and serve instead of their sons so that they could meet that quota. So, yes, enslaved men served in the war. And most of them did it under the promise of gaining their freedom. They were a bit surprised that that war was over. Most of them were not. But even more impressive was the number of free black men who readily enlisted to fight for this. And that all of them are who Thomas Pine represents, carrying the bird of 
real bird of operation. Carney's mother, the basket maker, is a She symbolizes the continuity of heaven, the persistence of heaven, and most specifically, of our ethnic heaven that carry on through generations, despite forces that try to vanish. She's a bridge between generations and between continents. You know something else about the I want to read to you a passage about the mother. This is talking about the Banneker Farm and the Eastern Shore. It's there that we work hard every day. Lots of vegetables, fruit, tobacco, and herbs we grew and with all scraps and maple trees. We had plenty of sweets too. As a lad, one I really loved it was made with young spice bush leaves coated in crystals from the sack tack from our maple. Ah, uh, that was a favorite candy that Ma made master of old Indian recipe. So she's like cross cultural because people were mixing that thing, learning each other's cultural ways. And I also thought that was a good way to introduce natural history into the book. As I said earlier, it's more than just painting different color faces. But it's important to include cultural history. And so this cuisine is, is a real one of Native America. They made they used the spice bush extensively. And, and that's what this arrangement is here. How many of you are familiar with the American spice bush? Take a leaf. Crush it. Take a leaf, but then pass it on. And you can smell that scent, right? And it was the young leaves, especially the young leaves. These are old leaves now. The young leaves have a very fresh, light scent. The old leaves, you know, these are tough. But the young leaves are very tender. And they were the ones that Native Americans would harvest. <coughs> they would make candy out of them. This makes red berries in the fall. They would dry the berries and use it like a pepper to spice their food. That's why they call it spice bush. They also made tea from the leaves and the trees. So this was an important part of Native American culture. Uh, later in the book, it discusses, yes, how the mother also from sweetgrass, reeds, bittersweet, and wild grapevine. My mother often made baskets, bowls, hats, mats, trays, which she also taught my sisters, like grandma for her, in the old African way. So again, the mother is carrying on the cultural heritage of her people, making baskets out of sweetgrass 
is still done today by Native Americans, by the Gola people of South Carolina, the black folk of South Carolina, who entirely stuck to their African heritage. This is one of their the Gola people's sweetgrass baskets. You can pass it around in case you haven't seen one and touch an item that was made by the, the real Gola here in America. Um, and bittersweet, we all know bittersweet. Incredible bond. So again, that's the symbology of the mother, what I consider a very important. The Carney family as a whole, symbolizes generations, all the generations of early Maryland, of black folk that were living. And we have yet to acknowledge today. It's lost its Those that come. Grandpa. Uh, grandpa to me is probably the most important character in this book. Not the not Mr. Connie. Grandpa to me is to me. He symbolizes the ideals, the truth and wisdom of Maryland, the land of Maryland in general, and of the African American community in particular. In a way, he's the Moses of the narrative. On this page, for those of you who may have the book, there are four official symbols of Maryland. Can you find some are pretty obvious? There are four official symbols. Grandpa, he was very old, and the storytelling of our family and community. He could sometimes be found with children from all around, and me sitting before him under the big old sweet bay tree, telling us stories of our legacy. Tales of how our car was one of 13, and how from two ships, the ark, and the dove from England, Maryland was winning. He told us that in this land, we are three peoples of humanity. He spoke of the explorers from the grand lands of Europe, adventurers from the enslaved, from the rich lands of Africa, and the first peoples of this land here that be. He told of the English captain, John Smith, who charted and found a way around the Chesapeake Bay. He spoke of the great Indian chief at that coast of the Choctaw. The Algonquian tribe that had several towns along the Choptank River back. How many people realize that when they go to the Choptank? And he never left out Ayas de Sousa, one of several black passengers of the Ark and Dove's original 1634 landing. Though he started here as a servant, he advanced to become a man of society. Always learning, De Sousa lived to be a fur trader and a sailor, and even a representative in the Maryland South. So he was probably our first black representative. And this was in the 1600s. Why wasn't he included in my education? Grandpa would speak of how so many of our people were stolen and chained then brought here from their African homeland in slavery, and how that was a pain on this land, against which we must all stand. For while we are all different, he proclaimed, we are all the same, people of one humanity, who all want to live in the land of peace and liberty. Yet, yeah, to me, 
be grandfathered on the top. Chestertown. Chestertown. A lot of people don't know that Chestertown was a really big city back then, almost as big as Baltimore. Very important port. And what really impressed me about Chestertown was their large black population. I'm, I'm sorry those slides aren't here. There's some slides I would want to include here, but Chestertown in the 1800 census had, I think it was about 1,600 people, 265 slaves. This is 1800, so shortly after the war. But while having 265 slaves, they had 400 free blacks. 265 slaves, 400 free blacks. The only one I ever learned about were the slaves. The majority of those people were free blacks. So I hope you're gathering where I'm like, it's the distortion of history that to me is a moral. I mean, you don't do that to a people. <laughs> war, the antagonist. In this book, war not only symbolizes the antagonist, but war symbolizes our ongoing struggle. And I mean that not, not just for black folk, but for all folk. I think the people in the Ukraine could be made to that state. That's what I mean. These are things a child probably did not pick up. And the classroom symbolizes the fraternity of men, the united in the book. There is a quote from Thomas Carney where he says, that's how we won the war. Where he's talking about all the different men working together. Not just one group of men, but it's of all different kinds of us um, men living in America to win this war. Some people have asked me about this shot, they say, that couldn't possibly have been in the 1800s. I beg to differ. In this book, the whole book occurs because a teacher asked Thomas Carney when he was 15 years old to give a talk about the war before her class. And I think that in this little school in Baltimore, and I'm not going to say it was Baltimore County or Baltimore City, but it could have been either one. When the word got out that an old revolutionary war soldier was going to speak, I, I think not just one type of kid showed up, but all of them, especially the old guys who fought in the war. They're going to hear what their comrade has to say. So I believe that shot is quite possible back then. That when the word got out that this teacher invited this old war veteran to come and talk. A lot of people from that town or that neighborhood came to hear him speak. And the old time people got up there all And when I was describing to the artist how I wanted them to look, I said I want the Native American who fought in the war. I want his uniform to look a little big on him. And, and I want the uniform on a white guy in the background look a little tight because the game is waiting on it. So, um, yeah, the art direction for the book was very specific. Very specific. And I, I'll share this with you. There were times I thought I'd give up on this book just because of the illustration. I knew what I wanted, and I was determined to get what I wanted. 
or I wasn't going to give it all. I'm like that. You know, just for that. And uh, the illustrations took two years. And one of the problems I had was this slide. And I mean, I was worrying friends and family. Uh, oh, maybe I'm just being too perfection. So I would love them and say, tell me what you think of the slide and send it back to me today. So I know they thought I was crazy. But in this, the, one of the things they did, they made all the black people one color. And I had to say, all black people are not protecting the I said, I don't know where you live, but here we are, a range of colors. And it, it took a bit of work, but I, I think I got a little bit of it. But she wins. And then people mean well. Okay, so that was the symbol. You don't have that. But I know people are going to really get on my case if I just do fantasy stuff. Especially when I'm saying you're leaving out our real history. I have to base it on facts. And so this is a discussion of the factual foundation. And it starts from Carney's real military record. The muster roll. You can't argue against that. You can't say he didn't exist. These are the muster rolls that show where Carney was serving and when he was paid. These are some of the actual muster rolls that I came across from the Maryland State Archives. I did not make Carney up. I only cite his major battles. I don't cite every battle he fought in. These are the major ones. And these are the major ones, and these were very important battles in Pennsylvania. These are the battles that led up to the British taking Philadelphia, where the Americans were doing everything they can to pull them way up the building to try to defeat uh, the British. The Battle of Brandywine was probably the bloodiest. I mean, that battle had over 20,000 men. And that's not today's warfare with drones and airplanes. These are 20,000 men coming up, clashing against each other. I mean, well, Brandywine was brought. And he survived. This is the trail. The trail they took starting at Chad's Ford at Brandywine, as you can see, leading up to Germany. This is factual. Yeah, I wanted a nice picture, a nice map, because when I was a kid, I would love to look at maps and books. But that is actual record. Again, I'm not including all his battles. I would have included Valley Forge if I could have found something to confirm the fourth battle. I could. Every battle in this book, I have primary source data to confirm, including these important battles in the Carolinas, North and South. The Battle of Camden, the Guilford Courthouse, off Kirk's Hill, and the 96 Star Force. Which I can go back. That's what this slide represents. That star port is still there in South Carolina, and it's a big tourist site. And uh, I think the walls were about 13, 14 feet tall, made of mud, and dirt. Uh, the Americans could not break through that. Another bit on the illustrations. When he first drew this illustration, he showed the Americans breaking through and defeating the British inside the fort. They couldn't break through that fort no matter how hard they tried. I said, I know you want us to win the war, but you didn't have 
happened in this battle? <laughs> so this is the trail starting in the middle at the Battle of Camden. Went up into North Carolina, came back down on uh, the 96 Starport over there, and ending with the Battle of Utah Spring. Utah Spring. Even though it was in 1781, two years before the war ended, was the last big battle in the Carolina. And Carney was a part of it. Other characters of the book Adam Adam and Baza Bill Moore. I did not make these guys up. I may have taken liberties in the book, but the book is based on that. I had to include Adam Adams. I've heard about Adam Adams for the past 20 years. And what fascinated me about Adam Adams is it looks like he was 14 years old when he enlisted. He was a free kid that enlisted. And I had a problem with that. I had to go uh, to Mr. Lowry, a historian at the archives who specializes in the same period that I work in. And uh, he said that was not unusual. That there were many kids, some were even younger, some were as young as 12 or 13, uh, who served. And I just thought that was most fascinating. A 14-year-old kid, black kid, who enlisted to fight for this country. We can't leave these people out. I have Carney meeting. Now, I admit, I don't know if you met him or not, but hey, it makes a good story. I had Carney meeting and mentoring him a year later when he was 15 years old. Uh, young Mr. Adams served all the way through to the war's end, and he retired from the war to go back to Charlestown and raise a man. Bazabil Norman from up in Western Maryland. And he was mentioned in uh, the Finding Your Roots program. But anyway, in one of those programs, they talked about Bazaar. I was amazed. Yeah, where is he getting up? Uh, because he ended up being uh, one of the ancestors of one of the actors or actresses uh, that was having their genealogy done. But Bazaville Norman served in many of the same wars as Thomas Carney. And in the book, I have them coming together after the war to have a beer with his talk. If they were serving in the same war, you know, a black guy who I know and see, at least it would not have been just have a good group. So yeah, some of his descendants include Jazz Peter Adams. I think I could write a whole book on Peter Adams and Adam Ross. Peter Adams was the first captain that Thomas kind of served under. And Peter Adams was kind of interesting. He was like this almost like, you know, going by the seat of his pants, crash. Captain Kirk kind of uh, captain serving in the war. Uh, I found an old newspaper clip about Captain Adams going to Chestertown or being sent to Chestertown to pick up this spot, to capture rather this spot. And it was a, a very big deal back then. And he came, he got some of his fame from what he was capture the notorious Adam Ross spy. And Adam Ross was an American who was spying for the British. And his spy escapades occurred through several uh, columns. Yeah, I, I think you can do a whole book which is two Adams and Adam Ross. And I found it interesting that Adam's commander described him as 
more commonly activated by the priest and invincible obstacles. Yeah, I don't think he's the most convenient soldier. Uh, Perry Benson is the captain that Carney saved his life at the start at the 96 Star Four battle when he got a serious musket shot in the chest. Uh, they became friends for life after that. He was promoted at that time. He was a captain. He got to be promoted to be brigadier general after the war. And uh, I guess in that position, you have a lot of clout. He was one of the main people to speak up for Thomas Carter, for him to get attention here in the And he spoke very eloquently his behalf. Other symbols in the book. This book, this symbol heads every chapter of the book. And I rather like it because it works, it has a dual meaning, you know, a different meaning for different continents and different people. And so for me, that's a great thing. It works. Uh, it's an African symbol for good fortune. It's also the Christian cross symbol, including for the night. So I, I sort of like that, and I thought it was appropriate to head each chapter. Other symbols, the early American flag, of course, and the British flag, the two countries at war. But that's not the only thing that those symbols represent. Because the editor for this book, Margaret Lord, was British. She's from, well, I'm sorry, was from England. I say that because she just passed in January. And I believe this book was the last project that she worked on as an editor. And um, she was also a very good friend. And I sort of felt honored when she demanded that she be the editor for this book. Because my publisher had, you know, an editor for the book. Margaret, an English woman, said, no, I need to do this book. I want to do this book. I'm going to be the editor for this book. Couldn't argue with Margaret. So I, I, I didn't really, my main apprehension was she was such a good friend. I didn't want our friendship to end, you know, working on it. It's kind of intimate when you're, you have to work really tight together when you're editing a book like this. But no, if anything is strengthened, friendship. She did an excellent job. Like I said, she was English, and if you remember when I, I don't know if I read the passage or not, but some of the passages when I had Grandpa or the father speaking, they're sort of talking in the vernacular, you know, not the Queen's or King's English. And there were times when she tried to make, she said, that's not the proper way. And I'm like, Margaret, this is 1700. He's a black folk. And you don't care if it's King's English or not. But she was good. Uh, I must also acknowledge, as I spoke of before, Mr. Owen Lowry. Uh, who heads the Maryland 400 uh, project of the Maryland State Archives. Uh, I have been, Mr. Lowry and I have been interacting for years uh, with each other via email and we had never met. I didn't meet him for the first time until a couple months ago when I took my class there. And I was surprised. I thought he was this old guy, you know, this old wizened historian. He's actually quite young, quite a good one. So uh, I had two great helpers in putting together this book. Other symbols. 
other people I'd like to acknowledge. Illustrators. Shante Daniel and Daniel Walter Davis of the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Uh, they put up funding to support this project, and I can't thank them enough. That holds true for Laura White, the State Art Council, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Heritage Museum, two of the four members of the Holocaust now. So. Exceptional supporters. It's one thing when you go through the trail of producing the book, but then when the book comes out, you still really need help. And when I got finished writing the book, I was very, very fortunate. I thought it come from Frank Armature, who wrote in support of the book, and I liked it so much I put it on the back of the book, of the Maryland Military Historical Society which really surprised me because they are very conservative. And for them to open up and accept this book and acknowledge what they may have missed is acceptable. And I, I see that. No uh, Asala, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, they have accepted and promoted this book from the beginning. And I must say them as well. And then the Daughters of the American Revolution, specifically Jerry Seiler and Helen Seymour. Helen Seymour passed last year. I never got to meet her, but I did have a couple phone conversations with her. That woman was collecting data, and she lived in the same county as uh, Mr. Connor, had been collecting data for Mr. Thomas Connor for decades. And she's not a formal, wasn't a formal historian, but gosh, she matched up so much info. Uh, one of the daughters of the American Revolution. And Jared Siler has sort of picked up where Miss Seymour left off and sort of inherited that bulk of data. That's Miss Sila there on the right. Yeah. And on the left is Mr. Wayne Kahn, who is a descendant of Thomas Kahn. And he and his wife live in the I want to thank the family and friends who have helped me put up with me during the time I was doing the book. And I also have to thank them because for years, for the last five years, up until this book came out, I was going to everybody. I mean, big, the top, and I mean top Maryland politicians, as well as street sweepers or elementary school kids or college professors. Asking everyone, can you name a Maryland African American picture in the world? And almost invariably, I got these responses. The only exception was a teacher in Howard County who was a Benjamin Banneker descendant. So I will be described by that. <laughs> And she taught at a private school. She told me, oh, sure. And I've always been teaching my students. And uh, the women, and, uh, one guy from the Eastern Shore who happened to live in the town for Thomas Connors. Other than that, and I know I must have asked a hundred people. The biggest response I would get was Christmas Adams. The problem with that is he's from Massachusetts. But he's taught in our school. I mean, I was taught about Christmas Addicts. Nobody from Maryland, sir, but Christmas Addicts is in Blackson, Massachusetts, sir. Peter Sale, he's also from Massachusetts. First Rhode Island regiment, the black troop, the famous black troop from Rhode Island that fought in the Revolutionary War. I also got, well, Maryland didn't have any. And a lot, oh, gee, I didn't know there were a black soldier. So, 
sometimes it's good to just shut up and let people read things for themselves. The greatest part of those that have a list are three <coughs> Negroes and Malachi. I didn't write that. That was written by the guy in charge of the recruitment effort for the people in his report to the government. And you can find the actual letter, because I like to see things accurately. You can find and see the actual letter, letter in the archives of Maryland. Volume 45, page 24. Is that specific enough? In case anybody want to question what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's also in the work of Dr. Paul, the Negro in the American Revolution. The greatest part of those to have is our free Negro and life. And then they're erased from the state. In closing, I'd like to read one more. We began as different people in different colonies, but as Americans, we came together in fraternity, and that's how we won our lands and independence. Ashen, I say we must pay homage to the many black, white, and Indian patriot soldiers who did not make it through that war to live to grow older and to see the newborn nation around and prosper. Ashen, you can't just put in different places, you have to put in cultural elements like Ashen. Retiring for the rest of my time back home in my with my family in the county of Carolina on the Maryland Eastern Shore. Now I, the storyteller, tell the epics of our great American Revolutionary War. How truly we all fought for the declaration of this nation, for the rights of freedom and equality in its creation. Thus here. In this telling of my story, I pass on to you, the spirit of all this, as we all must continue the journey for America to be more perfect for you. Indeed, the sweet land of liberty for all of us, including you and me. Thank you for coming. Thank you.